Well guys, after this video, I might as well just stop doing Star Wars reviews because what's the point? I'm reviewing the Thrawn trilogy. I After today, I am never going to review anything as big or as significant to the Star Wars fandom, especially at that expanded universe outside of the movies material. Uh, I'm never going to touch anything uh, that's as big as the Thrawn trilogy. It's, it's the most significant piece of Star Wars media outside of the movies. Um... And it means a lot to the fan base, and a lot of people have different opinions on it than the characters that were created and all the other different aspects that came out of those novels. Um, but now is a really good time to review it. And by the way, I'm joking. I am going to continue the series after reviewing the Thrawn trilogy. But um, now's a really good time to go back and revisit it, at least for me, because Thrawn, uh, the character Grand Admiral Thrawn, like a phoenix rising from the ashes, has... <laughs> has managed to come back and is now canon again. Um, you know, a lot of fans were upset that Disney decreed that the Expanded Universe was now no longer canon and the movies that they were developing would now... Um, uh, all the movies that they're developing now would kind of start with a blank slate outside of... Uh, except for the original movies and the, the TV shows like Clone Wars and Rebels, uh, any pre-existing material uh, would, would no longer be canon. Um, I was not against that move because there are a lot of books out there and even the books themselves contradict each other and expecting the filmmakers to fit perfectly within that gigantic continuity would be insane so it was just easier uh, on them to just go ahead and, and it just kind of ignore the books but the thing that people forget about Disney Disney likes to make money and there's a reason why the Legends timeline of the original Expanded Universe you, there's a reason why you can still get copies of them with the Disney logo, uh, you know, uh, printed on them. Because Disney loves to make money. And Star Wars is a cash cow that will continue to make money for them forever and ever and ever until the end of time. So, uh, you know, they're not going to take the Expanded Universe away from us entirely. Like I said, you can pretty much still get all... Most, if not all, of the books are still available. And... Um... You know, if there's a character from the Expanded Universe that's popular enough or gets a big enough response from the fan base, Disney is going to put that character in stuff because they like to make money. And I like to experience things that are good and I like things that I like, so I am more than happy to give them my money. So it's a nice little balance, nice little, little relationship. I'm fine with it. Uh, Disney lets me have my old books and they'll take the characters I like from those books and continue to put them in stuff. And... Grand Admiral Thrawn, he is canon again. He has appeared in the latest season of uh, Star Wars Rebels. He was great in it. Um, people who want my personal opinion on the matter. Uh, there, there are certain things they couldn't do with him because it's still a kid's show. But overall, I mean, they pretty much captured the essence of Thrawn. And now, Grand Admiral Thrawn is back in print because this month saw the release of the new Thrawn book. A standalone book that will exist in the new continuity. So... Thrawn's back, baby, and he's here to stay. And um, in honor of such a great character and one of my personal favorite Star Wars characters ever, whether it be expanding universe novels or you know comics, video games, whatever, Grand Admiral Thrawn is one of my favorite Star Wars characters. Uh, so to pay homage to him, uh, I'm going to go back and I'm going to review the original Thrawn trilogy uh, by Timothy Zahn. Uh, these three books right here are the biggest piece of Star Wars media outside of the movies and were so influential and uh, such a big part of uh, growing up as a Star Wars fan during the 90s. And I guess that's a good place to start is to talk about um, the impact that those books had because, and this has kind of been washed away by the sands of time, but back at that time, you know, the early 90s, it's hard to imagine it, but Star Wars was kind of dead. Uh, there wasn't any new material coming out. Um, there wasn't an influx of books or comics. Uh, we had the droids cartoon and the Ewoks cartoon and movies, and they didn't exactly cut it. And Star Wars was like, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of new merchandise coming out. There wasn't a whole lot of stuff to be excited about as far as Star Wars goes. It was like Return of the Jedi happened, and then it just kind of slowly faded uh, after that. Um, and then Timothy Zahn writes these books in conjunction with Lucasfilm, and... Uh, you know, as part of a new initiative to uh, kind of revitalize Star Wars, I guess, uh, through print form. 
Uh, we get the Thrawn trilogy. Uh, Heir to the Empire was the first book that came out in 1991 and made a huge splash and, you know, was an instant bestseller and did really well. Uh, was the start of this trilogy and ultimately, um, it wasn't the start of the expanded universe. I, as I've said before, Splinter of the Mind's Eye was the first book uh, outside of the movies that presented like different Star Wars material. But this was the thing, um, and and Dark Empire too. In the, if you want to go into the realm of comics, uh, those were the two things that really jump started Star Wars again and got us back on track to getting new material. We got more books. Uh, Special edition came out a few years later. Then the prequels came out. We all know what happened there. But um, this was kind of like a necessary step in getting Star Wars back on track and kind of reminding people how great it was. And um, honestly, my personal take on the book, uh, like I said, it was an essential part of reading if you were a Star Wars fan in the 90s. I've... It, for those of you who, who remembers the line from Wayne's World, you know, Frampton Comes Alive, it's like, yeah, if you lived in the suburbs, it was issued to you in the mail with samples of Tide. I kind of make that same joke with the Thrawn trilogy. It's like, yeah, if you were a Star Wars fan in the 90s, it was issued to you in the mail with samples of Tide. Or I guess the more appropriate joke would be free AOL. But it was required reading. If you were a Star Wars fan, you had to read the Thrawn trilogy. And for a lot of fans for many years... That was episode 7, 8, and 9. These weren't just three books that were really, really good. These were... Uh, they, they hit so close to the mark of what we wanted out of a Star Wars story that they're like, they were like official episodes to us. Um, and I think some fans would still say that this is the official 7, 8, and 9 because a lot of people... You know, some people didn't like Force Awakens. It was really well received, made a lot of money, but some people didn't like it. Last Jedi, we'll see. Uh, looks promising. Um, I enjoyed The Force Awakens personally, uh, but we'll see how this whole sequel trilogy plays out. Um, so far, it's not as good as the Thrawn trilogy, but that's like a hard, a tall order to, to fulfill there. And actually, I remember when Disney had first bought Star Wars and they were talking about making new movies. First question I had right off the bat, are... Are they doing the Thrawn trilogy? Is is that what they're doing? Uh, that was literally my first question because if you're gonna like adapt the books into movies, I mean Thrawn trilogy is like the best way to go. I mean that's the go-to. Um, you can do a better story to do a new, base a new film trilogy off of. It was it's and the material is right there for you and it's great. Um, so basically, these books I love them. They're my favorite Star Wars books. Uh, you know, I know that's a boring thing to say because a lot of people say that. Um, and you always get the contingent of fans that are like, oh, they're not really that good. They're overrated and the people get too, you know, <clears throat> obsessed with them and to praise them a little too much. Um, you know, my take on it is like, yeah, it's a boring answer to say the Thrawn trilogy are, are my favorite Star Wars books. But, I mean... When when they're right, they're right. I mean, it's just that good. I know it's the popular answer, but it's the popular answer for a reason. It's legitimately that good and a very enjoyable trilogy that didn't just rely on the pre-existing material. Timothy Zahn, who, by default, because he wrote the Thrawn trilogy, and actually, I think I've shown this off before, but I met Timothy Zahn at AwesomeCon in DC last year. And I got him to sign my copy of Dark Force Rising. Um, I don't know if you can see that right there. Uh, I, I think I've shown this off before. But, uh, yeah, it was an honor to meet him, and he was great. He's totally, totally kind of a nerd, but so am I. So it's a uh, really cool guy, very nice, and it was awesome that I got to talk Star Wars with uh, my favorite Star Wars author for at least a few minutes. And uh, he, he's got a great mind for Star Wars. And if you read his other books, like Allegiance and Scoundrel and... Uh, some of the short stories that he wrote uh, for some of the anthology books and uh, various other things. He's a really good writer that's really got a, an eye for the universe and uh, is just really good at presenting a Star Wars material. But even he has never been able to top uh, the Thrawn trilogy. He did do the Hand of Thrawn duology later, which I do plan on reviewing at some point in the future. But nothing he ever wrote, as good as some of it was, it never quite matched up to the Thrawn Trilogy because nothing else matched up to the Thrawn Trilogy because the Thrawn Trilogy is untouchable. It is that good and I love it. Uh, so I guess let's get started. Um, yeah, so like I said, we got the three books right here. Uh, Heir to the Empire which was the start of it. Dark Force Rising, which as I said was my favorite one of the three. And The Last Command, which concluded the story. Um, very nice, uh, very, very nice trilogy here. Uh, love my books. I love 
having a copy of these things. I think I've owned these things like two or three times because uh, I actually wore my first copies out many, many moons ago. But uh, what makes it so great? Well, the villain makes it great. Uh, you know, the, there's that old uh, belief that for your story to be good, you have, a, you have to have a good antagonist. For, your, for people to buy into your protagonist, you have to have a really good antagonist. And Grand Admiral Thrawn is one of the best Star Wars villains. And we all love Darth Vader. Darth Vader is iconic as iconic can be. Um, as far as villains go, as far as Star Wars characters go, um, you know, he's got the tragic backstory, the connections to Luke, the ultimate story of redemption. Uh, he's a great character and uh, is the perfect iconic Star Wars villain. Uh, the Emperor. We love the Emperor. I, I love the Emperor. I mean, he's the best part of the prequels, for crying out loud. And in Return of the Jedi, he is so one-dimensionally evil that he's great. I'm like, all right, I don't have a problem with a one-dimensional evil villain, but if you're going to make him that, go all the way with it. And the Emperor is so sinister and so evil and just sits there and enjoys being evil that it, it, he's amazing. And I love watching him. He is so much fun to watch. And it's just an old guy in a cloak just sitting there cackling. And he's one of the best characters in all of Star Wars. Um, I love the Emperor. I love Darth Vader. What I love about Grand Admiral Thrawn is that he is absolutely nothing like them. He's not a Force user. He doesn't have a red lightsaber. Um... He doesn't follow the dark side of the force. He's not a religious fanatic. Um, he's not even a political leader, uh, as um, we'll see in these books. That's actually Thrawn's weakness, is that he's not great in the political theater. He could never be the emperor. He's a great military strategist. He is a tactician. He is intelligent. Uh, he's great at coming up with battle strategies and, um, you know, and managing fleets and formations and all that other stuff. Uh, he is a military genius. He, uh, he's not a political genius like, say, the Emperor would be. And he's not quick to anger, and he's not quick to punish failure in the way that Darth Vader is. He's not an angry, vengeful force of nature that just comes through and destroys everything in his path. Thrawn is very cold, calculated, um, intelligent, and even takes defeats, as we see at the end of Heir to the Empire. He'll take a defeat, learn from it, and then come up with another plan to kind of get what he wants um, and ultimately achieve the victory that he ultimately wants to achieve. Um, the fact that Thrawn is so different from Vader and the Emperor uh, makes him such a great character because that's ultimately where The Force Awakens kind of messed up is that Kylo Ren is kind of a Darth Vader recreation. I get that that's the idea is that he's supposed to be a Vader fanboy, but it is kind of like, all right, he's kind of like Darth Vader light. Um, Supreme Leader Snickerdoodle. I keep calling him Snickerdoodle just to be a dick, but um, Supreme Leader Snoke is basically just a lesser version of the Emperor. And uh, this kind of happens in the books as well. Uh, typically, uh, my favorite villains in the Star Wars books and media are the non-Force-using villains because they're the ones that stand out more because they're different. Uh, Prince Shizor from Shadows of the Empire. I think he's great. Um... Uh, you know, Admiral Dalla had her moments, uh, especially in Darksaber. She had a really cool scene in Darksaber. Um, Gr uh, Grand Moff Tarkin, I think, is a great villain. I love him. Uh, Peter Cushing just owned that. And every anytime Grand Moff Tarkin pops up in something, whether he he has his own book now too. Um, and when he returned in Rogue One, it, you know, people made fun of the CGI and everything. But it's like, look, I'm just glad to have Tarkin back. I love Tarkin. Um, he's a great character played by a great actor and. Um, I typically gravitated to the non-force-using villains because force-using villains, while not all of them are bad, uh, there is that air of they kind of uh, recreate Darth Vader. And, or they're kind of like the Emperor again. So it kind of feels like a retread. Um, but you don't get that here with Thrawn, and it's great. And, um, you know, just so many of the little nuances with that character that are so great. Just the idea that he can pinpoint an enemy's weakness uh, by studying their culture, their philosophy, and their art. That is awesome, and that's really thinking outside the box, and really shows the type of mind uh, that Grand Admiral Thrawn has, that he actually gains almost an appreciation for a culture in order to take down a military opponent. Um, I think that's a very interesting way of looking at things. Again, to differentiate him from Vader and the Emperor, who were very lockstepped in their whole... Dark side rules the universe, this is the only way, we're authoritarian, blah, 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 blah. Um, 
Thrawn is more willing to immerse himself in another culture to try and learn more about them and help himself to defeat them. And I think part of that comes from the whole idea that in the in the original expanded universe continuity, there was this concept that the Imperials were racist and sexist, which is why most of the officers were white males. Um, but if you look at Thrawn, he's a chiss. He is blue-skinned, red-eyed, and somehow he was able to overcome those you know, break through all the glass ceilings or whatever and become a Grand Admiral in the Imperial Fleet. And ultimately, the big military commander that would be the major threat of this trilogy right here. And uh, again, it, it kind of the fact that they established that is like you know, the whole racism and sexism thing. And Thrawn was still able to succeed under that system. Um, that again makes his character even more interesting. It's like, wow, how good is this guy that he was able to overcome prejudice and stereotypes and, and uh, you know, oppression and all that other stuff uh, just to become, uh, you know, the Grand Admiral uh, in, this, uh, in this fleet. And, uh, you know, he's such a great presence throughout the book. It's just a joy reading his dialogue and experiencing um, uh, his planning and his, uh, you know, his stra strategies like formulating and everything because I remember reading it for the first time. I, it kind of reminded me of like um, reading Sherlock Holmes, where you kind of you may not get smarter while reading it because I wasn't always the smartest. Uh, you know, I wasn't always the sharpest knife in the drawer. But I didn't necessarily feel like I was getting smarter, but I felt like I was in the presence of a really, really smart person, and I felt like I wanted to get smarter while reading this character. And Thrawn, unfortunately, is kind of the bad guy here, but unlike Sherlock Holmes. Um, and Sherlock Holmes, uh, to kind of make that connection there, Sherlock Holmes is kind of my, uh, uh, are one of my favorite fictional characters of all time. So Thrawn, to me, was kind of the evil version of that. Uh, not in the same way. I mean, Sherlock Holmes is a detective. Uh, Thrawn's a, a military strategist and a commander. But um, just a lot of the things that he comes up with to try and, and execute these plans that he has. Um, when you get to the early portions where he's trying to recruit a dark Jedi... Um, to help him out and to accomplish, uh, use that, utilize that force technique that um, that the Emperor was using where he used his influence of the force to kind of improve the military execution of his own fleet. Um, it sounds a little crazy, but uh, Thrawn wanted to execute something similar because he believes that that was the reason that the Battle of Endor went south, was when they lost the Emperor, then pff, everything else just kind of went downhill. Um, and uh, he, to make sure that he can recruit this dark Jedi, uh, Master Joris uh, Saboth, Saboth, or, like I know I'm mispronouncing that. That's another thing that this book started, the whole like anagram looking and sounding names, uh, which continue to this day if you watch Rogue One. Um, you know, it's all, it's all great. Uh, just those really like, it, it, nobody opened up a Star Wars book in the 90s that didn't ask the question, how the hell do you pronounce these names? <laughs> but um, anyway, to recruit him, he makes sure that he gets these force, these creatures that block the force, the, the Asilomari, or is that, again, I know I'm butchering these pronunciations, but he recruits, the, he manages to get a hold of these creatures and uses them to block uh, Joris's ability to use the Force on him. So uh, he's able to have an easier time to manipulate him and get him to do what he wants. Um, when he's trying to raise his army against the uh, against the New Republic, um, and I'll, I'll actually go to Dark Force Rising here. The reason that Dark Force Rising is my favorite of the three books is when Thrawn's plan fully came together, I was like, holy shit, this man is brilliant. This man is so brilliant. Um, you know, uh, in the early portions of Heir to the Empire, he, he uh, recruits the Dark Jedi, and then he uh, opens up the cloning facility. It's like, what the hell does he need a cloning facility for? And he spends the rest of the book trying to get his hands on some ships. It's like, all right, I need some ships to build up the fleet again. Uh, so I can, you know, be a, a more of a threat to the Republic. Um, his first plan goes south. He tries to steal mole miners from Lando Calrissian, and ultimately Han and Lando are able to steal the mole miners back and uh, prevent Thrawn from taking control of Republic ships uh, through those mole miners. But um, Thrawn, not to be defeated, it's like, I've got a plan B, and I learned from this, and I'll come back with another idea. Um, uh, the second book revolves around... Uh, uh, the Katana Fleet, which is a fleet of lost ships from the Clone Wars era 
that uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn uh, knows about and is trying to locate, and he's going to take those 200 Dreadnought-class ships and use them to bolster his forces. And now with the cloning facility, he's got all the troops and manpower that he needs to uh, operate these ships. And it's like, holy shit, he is brilliant! Thrawn is brilliant! And um, by the end of the second book, it's like, wow, the, the, the New Republic is fucked. They are fucked! Fucked, and uh, just having that moment and ending on that cliffhanger with Thrawn fully in control, it was like, man, that is so awesome. I love Thrawn, and even in the third book, his whole strategy is to launch a full-fledged assault on Coruscant, trick them into with the holographic asteroids and stuff. Coruscant puts up their shields, and Thrawn's like, all right, I can wait them out, and they can basically starve themselves to death. So, I mean, Thrawn is just awesome, and he's very patient and cold and calculated, and things that Vader would not be. So again, just having a different experience of a different villain uh, made these stories so much more interesting. And Thrawn is such a great character and um, uh, the main reason that I love these books so much. And really the main reason, even though he's, you know, spoiler alert, even though he's ultimately killed at the end of this trilogy, um, it, it made me starve for more Thrawn material because it was like, man, I, I need more of this guy. Because this guy, and he's, he handles especially well on the page because again somebody that's that intelligent and uh has such intricate planning um i think that really lends itself to reading because it just turns all of his dialogues and all of his strategizing into just this awesome page turner and it comes across so well and um now that i've praised thrawn enough uh i love thrawn so much he's he's great uh let me talk about some of the other great things in this uh in this trilogy um one of the things I love about this is that this really does feel like an appropriate sequel to Return of the Jedi because um, after Return of the Jedi, what are the next big steps that the good guys have to do? It's like, all right, they killed the Emperor, they've overthrown the Empire, what do they have to do? Uh, well, they've got to deal with all the the fragmented uh, Imperial uh, you know, starships and all those Star Destroyers at the end of Return of the Jedi, those weren't all destroyed, so there's a huge contingent of Imperial forces that are still out there that they're going to have to contend with. They have to establish a new government. They have to, um, oh, well, Luke has to establish a new Jedi Order, and that's one of the best things about this, because um, Luke starts off in the story with Obi-Wan Kenobi's ghost basically saying goodbye to him. It's like, all right, you got this. You're the Jedi now, and Luke's just like, how the hell am I going to do this? Like, he has absolutely no clue how to build a Jedi Academy. And it's like, yeah, I was like, how do you do this? There's no precedent or anything that he can draw from to help him do this. So it's like, that was one of the most, like, of all the moments in all the expanding Universe novels, that was probably the thing I could identify with Luke the most, just that sense of like, okay, I've accomplished the thing that I was trying to accomplish now what? It's like, oh, I have to build up this ancient Jedi Order and establish it for the New Republic. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea how to do that. So, um, but yeah, there's a lot of things with the characters uh, from the original trilogy that uh, they continue in a way that feels very natural. Um, Leia um, has married Han Solo at this point. She's pregnant with the twins, J uh, Jaina and Jason. And... Uh, uh, she's trying to balance her family life with Jedi training and with uh, having to help run and establish this new government. And one of the things I always liked about Leia in the Expanded Universe is that she wasn't really that good at the Jedi stuff. Um, it always felt like it was something that Luke was kind of forcing on her because it's like, God damn it, I need Jedis. I need other Jedi to help me with this. And... Leia, I always felt like, it's like, look, she's trying to run a government. She has to help run military operations. Oh, and by the way, she also has a husband and kids. <laughs> I mean, you know, when Yoda talks about, um, you will know when you are calm, at peace. How the hell is that woman ever going to be at peace when she's got so much on her plate? Um, so the idea that Leia was n not really that great at the Jedi stuff made total sense to me. Um, because... And to me, like, Leia was better suited in other areas. I'm like, yeah, she's a better, like, military leader. She's a better politician. Um, she's a better, like, leader in those avenues that Luke can't be. So, to me, it's like, Luke, maybe you just want to go off and do the Jedi thing, uh, you know, by yourself or whatever. But that's the other thing that kind of fuels, like, each other's, you know, the two twins. It kind of feeds their own um, insecurities because Leia's trying to balance all of this stuff. 
uh, in addition to the Jedi training, and then Luke is trying desperately. It's like, I need some help to help set up this new Jedi Order. And it's like, uh, you know, it's kind of like a telemarketer. The first people they call are their family, right? So he goes for Leia and tries to train her. But, um... But yeah, so I was like, uh, it felt very natural for the two twins to be in the position that they were in for this trilogy. And Han um, shows his growth and development as he's getting into the realm of politics and being an ambassador uh, on behalf of the Republic and trying to form alliances and all this other stuff. And Lando, I love what, whenever Lando pops up in the expanded, it's the expanded universe, it's great because... <coughs> he's always either on some wacky business venture or he's involved in something shadier going back into his past with this old contact back when he was a, a much shadier individual and uh, helping the rebels out and getting them information that way Lando just it, there's it, he never ceased to surprise me there's just always something cool that Lando is up to and uh, really it was the expanded universe that helped me appreciate Lando even more even though I already liked him uh, the expanded universe really helped me to go like Lando's awesome I love Lando and in uh, Heir to the Empire, it starts off with him running this mining facility on this planet that's really, really close to a sun and, um, the, you know, with scorching heat so nobody can walk around in, like, you know, the way we do, like, walk around in the sun. They have to have a ton of protection and force fields and all this other stuff. And the shield ships were these giant, like, these giant ships with this giant shield on it that kind of eclipses the sun from burning the ships to a cinder. Uh, just those little details that just, uh, you know, help to build the universe a little bit and also kind of just, it's like, oh, Lando, only you. It's like, first you build a city in the clouds and now you're running a, a facility on a planet that no human being should be living on <laughs> because of how hot it is and having a shield ship and all that other stuff. I, again, that's probably the type of thing, I don't know if it would work in a movie, but in the books, it's amazing. And just reading about, like, how the gang has to actually travel to this place and how kind of tedious the process is is kind of funny. And um, so, yeah, I love that. I love the continuation of the characters and putting them in a position where, um, in the positions that they're in for these books, I think it felt very natural following Return of the Jedi. Um, and all the new aspects that are added, all the new characters, like... Uh, some of which would go on to be very popular expanded universe uh, ideas. Actually, one simple thing... Uh, Coruscant, uh, the New Republic government is established, or the capital is established in Coruscant, which was the Imperial uh, capital, the Imperial city. Um, it had never been named prior to these books, so that was a huge part of the mythology and uh, the universe. Is the, the central government city uh, or planet, and we never knew its name, we never knew who it was, we just kind of always assumed that it existed because it's never really talked about in the movies, uh, in the original movies anyway. And uh, the name Coruscant stuck, and now that went on to be a thing in the movies. Uh, you know, in the prequels, they go to Coruscant, so that name really stuck. And even other material, I remember I had Monopoly, uh, Star Wars Monopoly when I was younger, and the place where Boardwalk is supposed to be, um, they put Coruscant there. And that's really cool that this is where Coruscant got its name and got its start in the Expanded Universe material. So for the, the movie purists out there that don't want to read the books, um, the books had their impact, and that's proof of it right there. So, I mean, that, that's a direct case of the books impacting the movies, definitely. But um, <coughs> other aspects that I like, uh, you know, new characters. Uh, I already talked about Thrawn. I went on and on about Thrawn forever. I, I could... Talk some more about Thrawn if you want. He's great. I love him. Um, but Mara Jade, who's probably my second favorite expanded universe character outside of Thrawn, she fit into the main core of characters like a glove. Like, this was not a case of where they added a new body in there and it just felt unnatural or weird. Like, Mara Jade, I could picture her interacting with Luke, interacting with Leia, interacting with Han. And I think part of that is that they gave her such an interesting backstory, or Timothy Zahn gave her such an interesting backstory, where she was originally the Emperor's Hand, uh, which was uh, basically, uh, I don't want to say the Emperor's Gopher, but just a trusted assistant of uh, the Emperor who would run off and do missions, whether it be assassinations or whatever. And it's actually revealed that the Emperor planned to have Luke Skywalker killed off. Um without Darth Vader's knowing it, which that's an interesting, uh, you know, the manipulative nature of the Emperor. I like having that little layer added there. And she was actually one of the dancers in Jabba's palace. That's revealed. I don't believe, 
Again, I could be wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe there is a dancer that matches Mara Jade's description in Jabba's Palace in Return of the Jedi. Um, I've often wondered if the redheaded, like, kind of fish face dancer from the special edition is supposed to be Mara Jade. I don't know. I've heard that George Lucas didn't like Mara Jade, so I don't, uh, I, I find that very unlikely if that's the case. Um, but I, I don't really care. I, I thought, I was willing to buy the story. I'm like, alright, I buy it. It's cool. I'm fine with it. And, um, throughout these books, uh, she has made it her mission to murder Luke Skywalker because Luke, in her mind, Luke killed the Emperor, which he didn't, and that's ultimately revealed by the end, but she thinks that Luke killed the Emperor and, by extension, ruined her life, and now she wants revenge. And there's also, like, The Last Command, which kind of ties into the, the title of the third book. That's the other thing. The titles of these books are great because they could apply to almost anything. Like, Heir to the Empire could apply to Thrawn. It could apply to the New Republic. Um, you know, whatever. Dark Force Rising could apply to... Uh, Master Kaaboth gaining more power over Luke and Leia could apply to uh, Admiral Thrawn getting the Dreadnoughts uh, from the Katana fleet. Um, Last Command could apply to the Emperor's influence over Mara Jade, could apply to uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn's last military strike, whatever. Um, you can take the titles in several different ways, which I like, but um, basically she's struggling with uh, the Emperor's influence still hangs over her uh, through some like Dark Force you know, Dark Side of the Force, uh, Mystic uh, Mumbo Jumbo, uh, she still has the impulse to kill Luke, even when she starts to forgive him a little bit. And actually, in uh, in the books, they got trapped alone in the forest at some point uh, uh, on a planet, and they have to, like, rely on each other to save each other. And uh, they have to start forming these uneasy alliances and start trusting each other. And actually, through Mara Jade, that was really where Luke learned how to be a teacher uh, because Mara Jade is a force sensitive and has a, an aptitude for force abilities and it's through being able to win Mara Jade over and being able to convince her um, that hey I'm not all bad and you know use her you know use uh, use her as like his first student in a way um, that's able to give him the confidence he needs to be a teacher and ultimately establish a new Jedi Order a Jedi Academy etc cetera, etc cetera. And the end of the book, he ends up giving Mara Jade uh, his father's lightsaber, which I'll circle back to that in a little bit. But uh, Mara Jade's like character development throughout the books, where she started and how she ends up, uh, very satisfying. And I love that she continued to come back in the books and basically became one of the main characters. Uh, she became one of the main, you know, part of the main group with Han, Luke, Leia, Mara Jade, Lando, uh, Chewie, C-3PO, and R2-D2. And... Um, totally just uh, a great character ultimately as most of us know uh she goes on to actually marry luke skywalker and uh so we get that payoff there it's like oh the man i was gonna kill ended up being the man i would marry and i've talked about this before with luke having love interests because there are a lot of books uh truce of bakura dark empire 2 i think it was and um the kalista trilogy where they've just there was this obsession with giving luke a love interest and none of them worked except mara jade because it felt like that wasn't the goal was to give Luke a, a love interest. The goal was to just create a great character and a great new character to really help carry some of the weight in these books, especially on the good guy side of things. Because once you have Thrawn on the other side and you have Master Ka uh, Master Saboth uh, being all, all insane and stuff, you need some good guys on the other side to help balance it out. And uh, she fit the bill perfectly and uh, loved having her around, thought she was great. Um, uh, other universe building aspects I've already talked about the force blocking creatures that he brought in I thought that was great um, uh, the the Nagri uh, which is a race of creatures that uh, have a loyalty to Darth Vader that Thrawn is able to influence uh, to help out the Empire once again and he sends them on missions to kidnap Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker because um, part of the deal that Thrawn has with uh, Master Saboth which I guess I might as well explain Master Saboth as well. Um, he is a clone of a former Jedi Master uh, that Emperor Palpatine created to watch over his weapons stack on the planet Wayland, uh, which uh, Thrawn is able to take over and use for his own benefits. And he forms an uneasy alliance with Master Saboth to... Um, He's like, look, if you help me out with this and you give me everything I want here, I will give you new pupils to create a new Dark Jedi Order 
uh, which would be Luke, Leia, and the unborn twins uh, that Leia is carrying, and you can use them as the basis, as the foundation for building your own Dark Jedi Order. And Joris Saboth is completely insane. Um, he isn't a typical, again, he's not a typical dark Sith wielding, you know, red lightsaber wielding Jedi. He is a clone um, of limited mental stability that is completely insane and um, actually uh, becomes a strange form of temptation for Luke because Luke is out there trying to find a way to be a Jedi teacher and he comes across uh, Master Saboth and Saboth is trying to uh, influence Luke to come to the dark side but Luke is trying to save his sanity because he's like I need to prove that I can be a good teacher and that I can be able to turn somebody who's as twisted as uh, as Jorah Saboth and um, originally the idea was uh, according to Timothy Zahn and uh, you know behind the scenes material uh, the original plan was for the clone to be of Obi-Wan Kenobi presumably a version of the character that would have been named Obi-Wan Kenobi with two A's um, I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute, but, uh, it was ultimately, uh, vetoed by Lucasfilm, and they created this whole new character to serve as a, the clone of a former Jedi Master that Luke tries to save, but he's also, the, the clone is also trying to influence Luke to come to the dark side, and, uh, send, you know, the Nagri on special missions to kidnap Leia for the same purposes of manipulating her to the dark side, and, um, uh, this ends up paying off really well, because Leia... Um, after so many kidnapping attempts, even when uh, Chewie takes her over to Kashyyyk, um, and this is also the first time we get to see Chewie's home world, uh, unless you count the holiday special, which I don't want to go there. Uh, I'm going to pretend that the holiday special didn't happen, and this is the first time we see Kashyyyk. So <laughs> that's what I'm going to No life day here. But uh, anyway, uh, Leia is able to reach out to the, the, to the Nagri, and find out that her father, Darth Vader, has a history with them, and they are especially loyal, not necessarily to the Empire, but to Darth Vader, who convinced them that the Rebels were responsible for um, some tragedies that befell their people. And Leia, using her diplomatic skills and using her ability um, in the political forum, and her title, she, because uh, they end up calling her Lady Vader, and the fact that they respect Darth Vader... Uh, she's able to use that to her advantage to win the Nagri over to her side, which is a determining factor in ultimately defeating Thrawn, because Thrawn's uh, bodyguard, Rook, is a Nagri, and Rook is ultimately the one that kills him. So, even though it is a little anticlimactic how Thrawn gets killed off, I do like that it was Leia's political, you know, um, her political savvy that was able to lead to Thrawn's downfall, because uh, that's the area where Thrawn uh, isn't very good. He's, a, again, he's a military strategist. He's a tactician. Um, he's not very good in the political realm. And, uh, yeah, so I like that whole aspect to it, that whole subplot with Leia and everything. I thought that played off very well and had a good payoff uh, by the end of it, because in a way, it's like Leia kind of saved the day. Um, and uh, we also get to see Wedge do a lot more. That's another thing I liked about the Expanded Universe. We get a lot more time with Wedge. Wedge, who was this weird, like, favorite of mine for no reason, outside of the fact that, hey, he's the one rebel pilot that was present at all three major battles. Uh, Battle of Yavin, Battle of Hoth, and Battle of Endor. And survived all three of them. Uh, some will say, well, what about Luke? It's like, well, Luke wasn't a pilot at the Battle of Endor. So, um... Yeah, Wedge was the only one in a fighter in all three battles and survived all three of them. It's like, man, he must be a really good pilot <laughs> to get out of get out of certain death three times. So, uh, yeah, we get to see Wedge do more. We get to see Han Solo again being the diplomat, uh, form the Smuggler's Alliance with Talon Carde uh, as one of the lead figures in that. Talon Carde is Mara Jade's new boss because in her post-Empire life, she's found herself... Uh, working with smugglers, uh, not the most glamorous position, uh, hence some of her anger towards Luke Skywalker, but um, it also allows uh, for Han to build some of those relationships with, kind of like in his community, the Smugglers Alliance, and they also help take down Thrawn as well, so um, there's a whole like teamwork aspect where everybody contributes something that ultimately helps save the day at the end. Um, and uh, at the end, uh, I kind of referenced this already, but 
Uh, we get we do get a lightsaber battle. It's uh, Master Saboth, um, and a clone of Luke Skywalker that he created uh, using Lan uh, Luke's severed hand from Empire Strikes Back. Uh, he used that to create a clone, Luke, uh, with two U's, which some people have made fun of. Um, Timothy Zahn actually explained this at his panel last year at uh, AwesomeCon, and he said that uh, the reason he wrote it like that, the Luke clone has two U's in it, and even though it looks kind of silly, uh, his reasoning was, I wanted to make sure that uh, readers would be able to differentiate between the real Luke and the fake Luke, and that was his way of doing that. I was like, okay, that makes sense. If they were doing this as a movie, they probably wouldn't have to bother giving uh, the clone a name because um, you, know, you, you would be able to see that it's not really Luke because he has Anakin Skywalker's lightsaber that Luke lost in that same battle. So it's a nice little... At least this book explains <laughs> where the lightsaber came from. But I have hope that episodes 8 and 9 will give us an explanation of how um, Maz Kanata got a hold of uh, Luke's old lightsaber. But anyway... Uh, we get that. So it's Luke, Leia, and Mara Jade versus uh, Master Saboth and uh, the Luke clone. Mara Jade ultimately kills the Luke clone. So uh, that is her way of getting over the Emperor's influence over her. Um, you know, his last command of, you will kill Luke Skywalker. And uh, that's her way of overcoming that. So, oh, I killed the clone, so now I don't feel the, the influence of the Emperor anymore. And I'm like, all right, I buy that. That's cool. Um, very, very good. Uh, by the end, uh, Leia also gives birth to the twins, uh, which was, uh, you know, that would have major repercussions in future stories as uh, the two twins would go on to become Jedi themselves. I actually have a whole book series dedicated to them, the Young Jedi series, which was very popular uh, among young readers uh, back in the 90s. That's another one of those things. It's like, yeah, it was issued, if you were a Star Wars fan in the 90s, it was issued to you in the mail with samples of Tide. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I just, uh, like so many of the subplots and all the different things going on. Even uh, the whole idea of who Delta Source is or what Delta Source is, which is Thrawn's uh, method of ciphering information out of the Republic uh, to uh, aid him in his military strikes against them. Uh, that whole mystery uh, was very well done. Um, we got the character of Winter, who I felt like was kind of a... A red herring. I kind of felt like it was going to be revealed that Winter, when I read these the first time way back when, I, I remember feeling like Winter was going to be uh, revealed as the Delta Source. Turned out it wasn't her. It wasn't really anybody. It was just kind of a, uh, just a, an old uh, communications uh, thing that was set up in the Imperial Palace that Thrawn was able to hack into and, uh, you know, cipher information out that way. I, I don't remember all the details about it, but it was something like that. Um, there was also a conspiracy against Admiral Akbar. Poor Admiral Akbar, who really, it feels like he gets screwed with a lot in the Expanded Universe. And here he gets framed for tre treason and conspiracy. It's like, oh, poor Akbar. We all love Akbar so much. Why, why you gotta give him a hard time? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and it's got all the battles. It got, you know, space battles and everything. Uh, you know, um, you know, big, you got the big battle at the end involving the Katana fleet and, uh, Thrawn's whole, uh, Thrawn's forces going all out. Uh, actually, one other thing, uh, one other new character I like is, um, uh, Pelion, who kind of comes out as, like, Thrawn's right-hand man, and he almost, again, me gaining an appreciation for Thrawn, he is wowed and, um, amazed by the things that Thrawn is able to do and the conclusions that Thrawn is able to make and various other things about Thrawn, to where he almost serves as like the audience experiencing Thrawn. And because he's so impressed with Thrawn, we become impressed with Thrawn. So uh, I, I don't know if that was the intent of the character, but I really liked having him there. And um, he also added a lot. Uh, again, it's it's kind of a side character role, but he's memorable uh, for sure. And a lot of aspects of this are memorable. A lot of the characters and a lot of the story points are so memorable about the Thrawn trilogy. I love the Thrawn trilogy so much. It is... It is essential expanded Star Wars universe material. I, if you read no other Star Wars books, I think these, these are the ones you absolutely have to read. These are perfect. Like for me personally, they're 10 out of 10s, uh, great stuff all around. I love them. Um, I've read them at least three or four times. And I don't, I typically don't reread books after I've read them. Um, 
I, there are works of Shakespeare I have not read more than once. I've never read Romeo and Juliet, which is amazing because I own the complete works of William Shakespeare. It's over on my bookshelf over there. Um, of all the plays of William Shakespeare, I've never read Romeo and Juliet. But I've read the Thrawn trilogy, and my light just went out. Oh. Okay, light is fixed. Sorry about that. Uh, we're full of technical difficulties over here. But anyway, to wrap up the Thrawn trilogy, uh, like I said, I love these books. They're great. They're wonderful. I love them. Uh, they're my favorite piece of Star Wars material uh, outside of the movies. I would even put them above some of the movies, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. Uh, some of that goes without saying, but eh, whatever. Uh, but yeah, the Thrawn trilogy is great, and if there, like I said, if there are no other Star Wars books that you read, uh, you have to read the Thrawn trilogy. If you only read one string of books, it has to be those. Uh, they're that great. And now's the perfect time to get into it because, uh, like I said, Thrawn is back. He is canon again. So if you want to know, um, if you're a younger fan and you don't know everything there is to know about Thrawn, um, read the books where he got his start, and you'll see why fans fell in love with him so much. And like I said, there's a new book out now. Oh, wait a minute. What is this? Is this a new Thrawn book? I think it is. And what's this? I've already read it? Well, gosh darn it. I might as well review that too while I'm here. So, yeah, Thrawn. Um, part of the new canon by Disney. Uh, like I said, like a phoenix rising from the ashes. Thrawn is back. And, um can't keep a good villain down and uh like uh the original Thrawn trilogy this book was written by Timothy Zahn and uh which is completely appropriate uh he needs to be the guy that brings uh Thrawn back into the new canon at least in the book the world of books um you know they did bring him back in Star Wars Rebels and like I said he was great and that voice they gave him was so perfect I'm like oh my god that's not how I envisioned Thrawn sounding but my visions were wrong. That's how good that voice is. I was like, no, that they are. That was perfect. That was completely perfect. The, whoever they cast to do the voice, great A stuff. I love the way he sounds. And uh, it's even better now because I read uh, this new book with that voice in mind. And it makes it so much better. <laughs> I was like, oh my god. Because uh, now it's like I hear that voice when I read Thrawn's dialogue. And it's like, man, I want to go back and reread the Thrawn trilogy just so I can have that same experience. Uh, with that, that vo Now that I have a vocal uh, representation of Thrawn, uh, I can have that voice in mind when I read the books. But uh, what did I think of the new book? Uh, it's Thrawn's Return to Print. Uh, Timothy Zahn was the writer. Um... Overall, it's it's good, and I enjoyed it a lot. It's not an epic story on par with like the Thrawn trilogy or anything like it, uh, but it's not trying to be. It serves as kind of a biography of Thrawn, how he left his people, uh, how the Empire found him, how he met the Emperor, which was a great scene when he meets the Emperor for the first time. And how he moved up the ranks of the Imperial Navy and became the Grand Admiral that you see in Star Wars Rebels. Um, so basically the whole book is Thrawn just winning. Uh, it should just, they should retitle that book just Thrawn winning. Uh, Charlie Sheen, eat your heart out. Uh, Thrawn just continuously wins throughout the book and just gets one military victory after another. Uh, starting with his introduction where he's able to convince uh, the Empire to take him on. I, again, I referenced the scene with the, the Emperor. There's a great moment, and again, sorry, spoilers, uh, where he name drops Anakin Skywalker. It's like, yeah, I was exiled by the Chiss people, and I was in the wilderness, and I, I met a General Skywalker during the Clone Wars, and blah, blah, blah. And he name drops Anakin Skywalker and uses that to get the Emperor on his side and for the Emperor to take him on. I'm like, wow. That is awesome. And no, we do not get a detailed account of that meeting between Thrawn and General Skywalker. And it's like, man, I feel like there's material for another story there. <laughs> I feel like we can get another book out of this. Um, which I'm sure they're probably working on it right now as I speak. If it hasn't already been announced, I don't know. But I was like, man, that's awesome to picture. Uh, and actually, the end of the book, uh, Thrawn meets Darth Vader without knowing that it's General Skywalker. And that's another interesting avenue to take. It's like, it would would Thrawn be one of the guys to figure out and deduce that uh, General Skywalker is Darth Vader? 
That'd be interesting. Uh, I'd like to see if they go that route with it. But just to have Thrawn interact... I mean, oh my god, the book literally ends with the three greatest Star Wars villains, Emperor, Darth Vader, Grand Admiral Thrawn, all in a room together. It's like, that is... That's... that. I mean, it's fan servicey as hell, but it's like, I don't care. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. And um, if you love Grand Admiral Thrawn as much as I do, this book is totally worth reading because... Again, it's just him getting military victory after military victory and success after success after success and really showing how he progresses up the rankings uh, to become the Grand Admiral. And um, they give him an enemy. Uh, there's a rebel uh, codenamed Night Swan who serves as kind of like his... Uh, I guess I compared Thrawn to Sherlock Holmes. I guess he would be his Professor Moriarty. But it's also weird to think about is that Thrawn is basically the protagonist of this book and we're kind of seeing everything from his point of view and uh, from his side of the equation. So the Empire almost comes off like the heroes here <laughs> in a weird way because uh, it's like we spend the most time with them. So um, the victories that Thrawn achieves, it's like, yeah. And it's like, oh, wait, they're fascist and evil and basically space Nazis. Am I not supposed to root for that? <laughs> Probably not. But it's like, you know, uh, again, if you love the character of Thrawn, there's no reason you won't enjoy that book because it's just him being awesome. We we see him use art to, de de to uh, develop strategies over his opponents. We get to see him um, impress people at the Imperial Academy and deal with racism and uh, all sorts of other things and overcome all of that to uh, become uh, the, the top of his class and various various other realms and um it, it's just great to see and uh he also has another sidekick uh not Pelion, which i was a little disappointed by that i was kind of hoping that they would work Pelion into this but it's like all right we get a stand-in for him we got eli vanto who goes to the academy with thrawn and basically is attached to the hip with him all the way through uh they wind up getting stationed on the chimera which was Thrawn's ship in the original Thrawn trilogy so that was a nice touch it's like all right we put him back on the chimera i don't remember if they did that on star wars rebels they may have and i just don't remember but um to see it happen in the book was pretty awesome so it's like yeah okay we're good here but eli vanto uh like i said uh it kind of serves the same purpose that pelion did in the Thrawn trilogy where he uh um, he becomes so enamored with Thrawn's like successes and his brilliance and his how he's just a once in a lifetime commander and it's like man this guy's amazing and um, he stays attached to him almost at the detriment of his own career because he doesn't get promoted uh, beyond Ensign and Thrawn keeps getting promotion after promotion after promotion and he's attached to Thrawn every step of the way helping him out. And it kind of feels like he's getting swept under the rug. Um, and you thought, and I'm thinking, man, is Thrawn using him? Is he going to like throw him, throw him away when he is no longer useful? Because initially, he's very useful to Thrawn because Thrawn, um, the basic language of the Star Wars universe is not his first language. So he, even though he has some understanding of it, he needs a translator to help him out. And uh, Eli Vanto is there to do that. And... Um, uh, as it turns out, Thrawn is actually has complete confidence in Eli Vanto, uh, likes having him around, uh, considers him a trusted asset and ally, and um, I like their bond. I like their friendship. I'm like, yeah, I'm digging this. Uh, and you know what? Credit to Timothy Zahn. I'm a Giants fan, and he gave me another Eli to root for. So good on you, buddy. Uh, I, I now have two Elis to root for. It's great. It's wonderful. Um, so yeah, I, th I felt like their bond was kind of the heart of the book and um, them kind of relying on each other and helping each other and uh, succeeding together. There's a moment where Eli finally gets a promotion and it's one of the big like, yeah, fist bump moments of the, again, uh, that somebody's being promoted in a fascist, uh, you know, space Nazi regime. But still it was like, you know, I kind of got sucked up into their whole relationship and everything. And um, uh you know, uh, kind of liked uh, Vanto, so I got to this point where when he finally got promoted and got a big promotion, I was like, yes! Good on you, buddy! Good on you! Uh, so, in this book that I expected to just completely glorify Thrawn, and it does, um, it gave me another new character to really latch onto and to really like, so I, I hope he comes back, and the way the book ends, uh, I fully expect him to come back in some way, shape, or form, um, again, I, I'm spoiled enough as it is, but uh, there's plenty of room for Eli Vanto to come back, and uh, I hope he does. I kind of like him. But now that this book has come out, it's proven that 
expanded universe characters that were rendered non-canon, they can come back and they can make a big splash. Uh, we saw it with, we've seen it with Thrawn. So uh, already off the top of my head, I'm thinking, all right, let's start bringing in some other great expanded universe characters. Let's get Prince Shizor back. Uh, the Ahsoka book, which I'm going to review at some point, the Ahsoka book made references to the Black Sun, which I'm like, oh boy, are we going to get Prince Shizor? That would be cool. I'd be down for that. Um, you know, could we get Exar Kun back? I mean, Exar Kun is basically Star Wars version of Lucifer. So can we get him back? Uh, can we get uh, Mara Jade back? I, I'm shocked she's not back already. She's such a big character. Um, there's so many great characters in the Expanded Universe and so many great stories that are, could easily be adapted into a new canon. Do it. Just just do it. Uh, like I'd be totally down for it. Um, and by the way, just throwing this out there, I am the only Dorsk81 fan on the planet. If uh, Disney, if you're listening to this, if we can get a Dorsk 81 standalone story, or at least an origin story or something, I would be down for that. I'm just saying. Just please. I know I'm the only Dorsk 81 fan on the planet, but I would love to have him back. Come on, bring my boy back. I want me some Dorsk 81. Let's do this. But, um, yeah, so that's four book reviews. Really long video, but yeah. Uh, I recommend checking out the Thrawn book. I'm not saying it's one of the best Star Wars books ever written, um, and actually, there's a lot of focus on Governor Price, who's also featured in Rebels. Uh, there's a lot of focus on her, too. Uh, some of that stuff drags on a little bit, because th there are times when they're focusing on her where I'm like, can we get back to Thrawn, please? And she does tie into Thrawn, and they form a, rela a relationship based on, look, you're good at the military stuff, I'm good at the political stuff. Um, you're going to need me and I need you. Uh, and she's actually in the show Rebel. She's the one that recommends Thrawn to take care of their Rebel problem on Lothal. So um, so not a complete waste uh, to expand on her and to give her some material. I just felt like there was a little too much of it. And it felt like whenever they focused on her for long stretches, I was kind of like, yeah, can we get back to Thrawn? I want to see more Thrawn. But a uh, minor nitpick. Uh, otherwise, really good book. If you love Thrawn, you're going to like this book. Uh, so I recommend it uh, as well. And one of my more favorite books in the new canon so far, uh, not my favorite, my favorite one I'm going to review at some point in the future, but uh, for right now I think that's one of the better books in the new canon, um, especially if you know for people like me that are huge Thrawn sycophants. So uh, again, that one gets my recommendation. But like I said before, if you read no other Star Wars books, the ones that you absolutely have to read are the Thrawn Trilogy. They are required reading. That is your homework until my next review next month. You have until then to read the Thrawn Trilogy if you haven't already. If you have read the Thrawn Trilogy, your homework is to read it again and again and again and again and again because it's great. Um, and I will be checking all of you uh, when I do my next video. Uh, not really because that's impossible and I'm not a psychic. But... Um, but yeah, I hope you all enjoyed this review. I was really looking forward to doing this one because, like I said, I'm, I'm kind of a Thrawn fanboy, if you can't tell. Uh, so I had a lot of fun talking about him and revisiting uh, the books that really got me into uh, getting enjoyment out of Star Wars in the world of print. Uh, and I think that's the main positive to take away from these books, is that they're the ones that really expanded on that galaxy far, far away and really got me interested in finding out what else happened after Return of the Jedi or before A New Hope or in between A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back or between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. All those things. Um, you know, these books, that original trilogy, were what really opened that door. And I couldn't be more grateful for it. And I'm glad to have it as a Star Wars fan. So that is the end of my really long review and video where I uh, basically just fanboyed all over Thrawn, but uh, that is all I have for you now. Uh, stay tuned for more. I'm going to have a, uh, another Star Wars review up next month, but until then, I will see you all later.